Hi guys, welcome back to the Soy Food Podcast. I'm your host, Noma. And in today's episode, I want to speak to my ladies out there about the power of a woman's influence. As we know, the term influencer is one that many of us are probably familiar with. In general, it means a person who inspires or guides the actions of others. In this day and age, the title of influencer is automatically given to anyone that has a large following on social media, and rightly so because society measures influence in numbers. As a result, unfortunately, many people don't pay much attention to what they're being influenced to do, or even study the character of the person they are being influenced by. But as Christian women, we are not to allow ourselves to be easily influenced by the world simply because someone has a large following online. Instead, we are meant to use our discernment to test every spirit to see whether they be of God or not. And in so doing, determine whose voice we listen to and whose lifestyles we imitate. Contrary to popular beliefs, the Bible teaches us that God categorically fashioned women to be influencers and not just only those that have a platform of a large social media following. In Genesis chapter 2, after God created the first man, Adam, gave him an identity, laws to live by, as well as a purpose, which was to tend to the Garden of Eden, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone and went ahead to make him a helper that was suitable and comparable to him that will essentially help him accomplish his God-given purpose. This is why God made Eve, who we know, of course, later on became Adam's wife. But in order for Eve to achieve the purpose for which she was created, meant that her voice needed to have been instrumental in her husband's life. Otherwise, how was she going to help him achieve his God-given purpose? So this is why I say as women, we are all natural born influencers. But unlike the world, we are meant to use our power of influence for good. Therefore, in this two-part short series, we will look at two examples of female biblical characters, one that used her influence for evil and the other that used it for good, just to learn from. The first biblical female influencer that we will be looking at is Potiphar's wife. Now, the story of Potiphar's wife and Joseph is one that many of us Christians know off by heart. Though I find that when we tell this story, we tend to focus on the parts where Joseph eludes her several sexual advances. And rightly so, because what Joseph did was very admirable, especially considering the fact that he was only a teenage boy at the time. But for the sake of today's episode, I would like to look at this story again with more emphasis on how influential her voice was to her husband, Potiphar, who was an officer of the Pharaoh at the time. Bear in mind, ladies, that what I'm about to share about Potiphar's wife happened at the time when Egypt was the world's superpower, kind of like in modern day America. So let's read her story in Genesis 39, verse 1 to 13, which says, When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realised that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. 
Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. He refused to sleep with her and he kept out of her way as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Now, if what Joseph did here is not a live image of flee from sexual immorality, I don't know what is. Immediately after this scene in Genesis 39, with Joseph fleeing from Potiphar's wife's seduction, her husband comes home and she basically tells him that Joseph tried to rape her. She even showed him Joseph's cloak to back up her claims. But from our earlier reading, we know that the only reason she had Joseph's cloak in her hand was because of the death grip she had him in and the fact that he had struggled with her so much that just to get away that he basically just forgot his cloak in her hands. She was holding on to him that tightly and practically ripped it off of him. Well, hearing all of this after a long day at work made Potiphar so angry that he did not even ask Joseph for his side of the story before instructing he be imprisoned for his alleged crimes. I can only imagine the level of betrayal that Potiphar probably felt towards Joseph because although he bought Joseph as a slave, as far as your master-slave relationships go, theirs was very unconventional because Potiphar trusted Joseph so much that he put him in charge of his entire household and entrusted to his care everything he owned as his attendant. So this must have been a big blow to Potiphar's ego. Sad to say that Joseph ended up serving a 13-year prison sentence for a crime he did not commit, purely because a wife said so to her husband. Ladies, that is the power of a woman's influence. And I don't say this to condone what she did, but to highlight how persuasive and instrumental Potiphar's wife's voice was to him, even at the level of political power and influence he most likely had in their society as an officer to the king of Egypt. However, we know that as Christian women, just because God has blessed us with the power of influence does not mean we are to use this ability to manipulate those in our sphere of influence or use it in any way, shape or form for selfish reasons or gains or to harm others like Potiphar's wife did. I wonder how Potiphar's wife's actions affected her household because from what we read in Genesis 39 verse 5, and listen to this carefully ladies because this is where the lesson lies in in Potiphar's wife's example. What we read in Genesis 39 verse 5, we know that from the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of Potiphar's affairs, household affairs, ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. I am convinced that part of the reason why God blessed Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake was due to how Potiphar was treating Joseph even as his slave. The fact that he trusted Joseph with his entire household, even as going as far as making him his personal attendant and basically not worrying about anything, just leaving everything to his care. It just goes to show they had a very healthy relationship, even though it was a master to slave relationship, it was very healthy. And at the very least, Potiphar was fair to him and treated him justly. So if God blessed Potiphar because of Joseph's presence, as well as the way Potiphar was relating and treating Joseph in that house, I wonder how then Potiphar basically turning against Joseph because of 
what his wife has said to him and getting Joseph locked up. I wonder what that must have done to his household affairs and even his crops and livestock. Besides, at the end of the day, ladies, God makes it very clear how he feels about liars and those that bear false witness against others. In Proverbs 6, from verse 16 to 19, for example, which says, there are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things he detests. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill the innocent, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who sows discord in a family. I know in this day and age, we've categorized lying and even color coded it and everything into white lies and black lies and all of that, and little lies and small lies. But the truth still remains that God hates it so much that it made the vice list that we read in this Proverbs twice. It's no joke. And in the case of Potiphar's wife and Joseph, we understand and see why God feels so strongly about this sin because it literally destroys lives and it destroys people's source of livelihood. Plus, overall, the Bible is very prescriptive on how we are to treat others and relate to one another. And what Potiphar's wife did to Joseph was wrong. There's no two ways about it. At the same time, we know that the natural law of harvest says, you know, you reap what you sow. Now, because Potiphar's wife may have thought she had gotten away with what she did to Joseph. She had basically covered her tracks by lying on him. Because when she did that, there was no way for Potiphar to then find out that actually it was her that was coming on to Joseph. Because we see that he was so angry that he didn't even ask Joseph, like, what do you have to say about these allegations that have been brought to you? So clearly Potiphar's wife knew and thought she had gotten away with it. And even though the Bible does not say anything on the point I'm about to make, but again, I I wonder what the dynamics between Joseph and Potiphar's relationship was like and how basically Potiphar's wife's lies, how he affected that. Because we know that 13 years later, Joseph was released from prison. And not only that, he was promoted to second in command in all of Egypt, essentially became Potiphar's boss. So just some food for thought, ladies. So I think it goes without saying that we should be very careful not to weaponize, abuse or misuse, you know, our power of influence and really and truly the gifts that God has entrusted in our care in general, because it not only harms others when we do this but it also has a way of coming back to haunt us so that's all for now ladies stay tuned for part two until then peace and blessings